Thank you for the introduction, Peter. Um, I'm just going to start by briefly telling a bit of, about how this project first began. Um, so needless to say, it's a very exciting day for us, um, not just to celebrate and share our book with you a few, week, a few weeks ahead of its launch, um, but to be doing so here at the Strand during New York Design Week with three incredible minds here in person is truly a treat. Our publisher, Princeton Architectural Press, uh, was actually my first employer right out of college. And when they had approached us several years later about authoring 20 over 80, we, we had just come out of school again, this time um, for an MFA in design criticism at the School of Visual Arts. It was there at DCRIT, as we like to call it, um, that Bryn and I first met as students of design history, research, and writing. And of course, once that journey of learning and being a design student begins, it never truly ends. You're constantly learning on the job, from your peers, your colleagues, and in our very fortunate case, from those who have paved the way for so much of our understanding of 20th century and contemporary design as we understand and appreciate it today. Um, so it's from this perspective as lifelong students of design that we dare to approach these 20 legendary figures to partake in a conversation with us on everything from those incredible and canonical moments in design that have evolved into near myth and which I'm sure all of you have heard and are familiar with um, to their creative sources of inspiration, advice for younger generations and the projects that keep them busy today because admirably nearly all of them continue to produce work six decades into their careers and beyond. To our complete surprise and delight, these 20 esteemed individuals were not only happy to participate, but were completely generous, gracious, and even a little irreverent in their insights that they shared. One of our first interviewees for the book was our dear teacher, Ralph Kaplan, who is here in the audience tonight. Ralph, being the brilliantly inquisitive person that he is, asked if we intended to reference the Pareto principle with this book. Though it hadn't directly played a role in the idea of it, it certainly seemed fitting. The Pareto principle, otherwise known as the 80 over 20 rule, or law of the vital few, posits that roughly 80% of effects come from 20% of a given population, or something along those lines. <laughs> the 20 conversations we've shared collect some of the most compelling voices in architecture and design from the past century. And although they represent a small sampling of a larger whole, these individuals wield great and enduring influence. And so in a delayed response to Ralph and to our interviewees, we hope you enjoy this book, which is really a toast to all 20 of you collectively, the design world's vital few. And so with that, I'm going to hand it to Bryn to introduce our three panelists who we're so excited to have here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Happy. <laughs> so on the end, uh, is this on? Hello? Uh, on the end here, we have uh, Jack Lenore Larson, who is a textile designer and maker. He originally trained as an architect before he found his true calling in textiles. He Excuse studied. Me. Can you hear? I can't. We can. Okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> you don't need it, do you? You don't need it. <laughs> fine. Closer? Yeah. Okay. He founded his uh, New York studio in 1951 and uh, later became a consultant for the U.S. State Department. He traveled all over the world, becoming a uh, cultural ambassador and introducing color and texture to the American market. He's a writer, a curator, a collector. He's very interested in the role of objects in everyday life. He currently splits his time between a Park Avenue apartment and Longhouse Reserve, which is a, uh, his country home and 16-acre estate in East Hampton, which houses thousands of objects uh, and is really a case study for living with art. Uh, it's open to the public and Jack leads tours and um, of the grounds and sculpture garden. Am I on first? Oh, now I'm gonna introduce Seymour. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next to him we have Seymour Quast, a designer who illustrates. Uh, Seymour is a graphic designer with an extremely diverse body of work. Uh, he creates posters, books, packaging, animations, uh, you name it, he's made it. Uh, he has, his work has had a lasting influence on American visual culture. He's a founding partner of Pushpin Studios, which emerged in the 1960s as a revolutionary force in design, and he has helmed Pushpin ever since. 
Pertinent to our talk tonight, Seymour is a lifelong New Yorker. He was born in the Bronx, attended Abraham Lincoln High School in Coney Island, and then went to Cooper Union. So far, he has two monographs about his work. Uh, as well as a book devoted to all 86 issues of the Pushpin Graphic, which was the uh, publication published by Pushpin for many years um, as a sort of promotional piece and experimental journal. He is also currently in the midst of his first Kickstarter campaign for a book that he's working on uh, called Seymour Quast at War with War, which uh, features original illustrations in a timeline of the 5,000 years of war, which we'll hopefully talk a little bit more about tonight. And then lastly, here we have Jane Thompson, right to my left. Planner, designer, editor, urban advocate. She's joining us all the way from Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> she, since 1994, has... Uh, led Thompson Design Group, an interdisciplinary design firm focused on historic preservation and the revitalization of cities. Um, with my husband, Ben Thompson. Right? With her husband, Ben Thompson. <laughs> no, it hasn't been mentioned. <laughs> uh, Jane moved to New York City the day after she graduated from Vassar to join uh, MoMA's design and architecture department. She uh, was the founding editor of ID and is one of the foremost scholars on the Bauhaus, which we'll maybe hear a little bit more about tonight as well. Um, with her late husband, Ben Thompson, she was the owner of Design Research, a pioneering retail store in Cambridge as well that brought modern living to American homes, introducing us to brands such as Marmeco. And Jane uh, has had a hand in so many of the civic spaces that we all know and love, including uh, the master plan of Grand Central, Chicago's Navy Pier, and Governor's Island. And in 2010, uh, Jane was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Design Awards. Thank you. Please join us in welcoming them all here tonight. Would you bring one back? <laughs> it has my notes. Oh, thousands of notes. <laughs> Okay. So, so, so since we're all here in New York and it's Design Week, I, I'd love to start the conversation off by asking each of you, how, how did you first discover design? It seems like a lot of people even today, um, you know, they say they, they have, they're unable to kind of discover it as, a, as an option or a profession until much later in life. What, what kinds of paths led you to design? Okay. Is, is it you? <laughs> all right. I, um wanted more than anything else in life to be an architect. And uh, so I uh, went into <coughs> architecture school and uh, worked uh, till four in the morning every morning and uh, enjoyed it a lot. But I, then we had to do a material study course and it involved learning something about weaving and even to weave a little bit. And I really like that of working with my hands, working with real material, however small it was. It was something real as opposed to a, not a building that would never be built. And slowly, I decided I'll be a weaver for architecture, and uh, that sounded all right. I uh, had some uh, clients even when I was an undergraduate. And I went on to uh, Southern California. I uh, was disowned for going, but uh, this is from <laughs> Seattle. Um, and, uh, and it was fantastic in the 40s, because all the Europeans seemed to be there. Uh, yes, yes. Nijinska yes. and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the architects and the, the, everyone that seemed exciting to me were there, and I even met them, and uh, had a wonderful time. And uh, I returned to the University of Washington to receive a, a degree in included weaving, uh, and uh, became a graduate assistant, and uh, uh, was, was uh, taught to weavers uh, classes in uh, design and color, uh, and was given a full scholarship to Cranbrook. And uh, that was pretty great in those days. Yeah. It was a small school still, and uh, uh, it was 
it was it was wonderful and I I learned how to work quickly that I had not done as an undergraduate but um, uh, it was the pressure was to make something overnight and that's often the way business is and it treat, treated me well as I went on to to uh, New York City. Uh, I would have gone there for a week in spring and it was the first I'd lived in Los Angeles. I knew San Francisco and Chicago but New York was the first place I felt at home. Half the people living here in 1950 were foreign born and uh, yes. it was so exciting. MoMA was uh, the nucleus of, of modern design of the world and uh, they treated me well uh, uh, and I hooked up with a man who arranged for my to do the uh, ornamental fabric for a lever house, the first high-rise uh, in America and that, that helped and uh, I didn't know that this was the only place to be at that time. <laughs> this, is, this is where the press was and the market was and uh, uh, they were 125 people out looking for new design talent and uh, it uh, did worked very well for me. <laughs> By the end of the year I said I still may starve but I'll get an obituary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and Jane, your first job out of college was at MoMA but you had a background in dance and theater. No, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you want, you want to skip over the poem because I think it ties right into his. I mean, it, it, it's a, a very important experience, and it doesn't happen to anyone. And I have to tell you, I had no no hand in getting it. Um, in a few words, I graduated in 1947. I wanted to work at MoMA. There was something about the atmosphere that was me, and it was just new, and it wasn't very well thought of, and who are we gonna wear sandals for, and you know. But I, uh, I couldn't get a job. The boys had just come back. All jobs were gone. There were no jobs for women. You remember, remember this is true. So I went to, to a specialist and learned shorthand in the last year of my college. And I, we went through in three years, a great hurry. And um, the minute I graduated, I rushed into the, uh, what do they call it, the personnel office. I mean, I knew the place. I'd been there one summer as a, uh, so, um, and he said, well, you have to take a test if you want to be a secretary. And this is how it works. And I will dictate a, I'll dictate a letter. And um, he did. And I, he said, all right, um, I'll give you a chance when one comes up and just show up tomorrow. And I showed up tomorrow. And he, uh, you know, he's a nice guy. He said, there's a the guy down the hall who wants to take a letter. I mean, isn't this? another world and uh, just go down the hall turn left his name is Johnson <laughs> well little did I know <laughs> I learned very quickly um, I took the letter for Mr. Johnson who I never called out again and um, I was the next day he hired me for the department and just to do you know the crime work this is my, the message of this is don't ever turn down a bad job in a good place. I mean, it, it really uh, uh, it didn't bother me the least to be the lowest on the totem pole. I was just so bloody pleased to be there, and the people that I worked with uh, made my life actually. I, I, I worked for uh, Peter Blake, and uh, A. Louise Huxtable was my mentor of uh, friendship, and Mary Barnes, and Alfred Barr up the street, and uh, I mean, the world was there, and it wasn't really known. I mean, it wasn't hot stuff the way it became later on. It was just an environment and a, a way of thinking, and the, the way of thinking that was extraordinarily different, uh, different, and I didn't know that, that then, but is that the museum was based on a theory that all things we make are art, and there is a universality of art. And everything must be considered in those in those terms. And 
besides, we must make our physical environment, and pots and pans and terrible other things, in good quality because people deserve it and so on. So the, the, the whole the museum of many parts was invented there. And, uh, and after that, a lot, a lot of things, other things happened. Uh, but I think the, uh, the modern museum itself as an institution has had an awful lot to do with the success of design. Uh, later on, we had the, you know, Edgar Kaufman's good design thing and so on and so on. On. And it's kept the thing alive and in the circulation and social circulation as well. So I just say good luck favors the well prepared, but also the ill prepared. <laughs> uh, why I really went to, um, well, I'll just finish this, this one. Um, why I. Uh, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I, was, I don't have a connection for that one. I'll, we'll, we'll get to Ralph Kaplan and other things later on. Yeah, we can come back to it. Seymour, <laughs> uh, do you want to tell us how you uh, discovered design as a career? Yeah, well, I, it was, I was six years old and decided what I was going to do for the rest of my life, uh, which was to be an animator, because uh, I saw uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and that was it. There was nothing else. Pinocchio was even a little bit better. I really was, was going to uh, uh, go into making funny drawings for the rest of my life. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, on the, I was on the subway with my mother and she was talking to somebody who, who knew about Walt Disney and uh, my mother was told that you can make $25 a week working for Walt Disney and that reinforced <laughs> the idea very strongly. Yeah. Um, However, uh, happened to, we happened to move to Coney Island when I was about 15, and while I thought I was going to go to music and art high school, which is what all the smart kids did, uh, my father went to the, the local Abraham Lincoln High School, and um, he was told, uh, no, there's a, we have a great teacher here, your son is going to be very happy, and it turned out to be true. Uh, Leon Friend was, uh, was the teacher who had come from Germany. He had written a book called Graphic Design, which was yeah. hardly known in those days. Um, and I did, at that point, I wanted to be a designer. He, he taught us about poster design. The early um, uh, designers from uh, Consadra all, all the way up, uh, modern modernist designers, Victorian designers. Uh, post design was was great, um, but I did lose a a, a poster contest to J. Mazel, who's a very well known photographer now, uh, because he used airbrush in his design, and he his design went over mine. But, <laughs> Luckily, I wasn't too discouraged. Um, and I, I, I credit that the experience in, in high school getting me into Cooper Union, which was great because uh, otherwise I'd have to go to Brooklyn College, which was, I don't know where I'd be. I wouldn't be here now. <laughs> um, but I had some terrific classmates there, Milton Glaser and Ed Sorrell, Reynolds Ruffins. Really? And we sort of banded together. And at one point we did freelance work. Uh, Milton decided we should be a, a studio in our third, I think it was a, after the second year. It was only a three-year course. He called it Design Plus. Uh, Reynolds did some designs, uh, silk screen designs for placemats that we sold to Wanamaker's department store. Uh, we sold them on a, on a gross of these cork, they were cork placemats, uh, which we did by hand. They were, they were all you know, drying all over the studio that we had. Um, and then business was, that was it. We went out of business. <laughs> but <laughs> but had fun. <laughs> um, when, um, when we graduated, um, we had a we had a studio where on 13th Street, uh, not far from here, uh, where we brought our girlfriends and we did homework or freelance jobs that we were doing or, or whatever. 
and um, um, I did a, you know, I to get some freelance work, came up deep with the idea with that Sorrel to do a little thing called, uh, we call it the Pushpin Almanac, and it was a form of, of uh, like a farmer's almanac. Mm. And we did, did that, and we were able to get uh, freelance work. While we, uh, Ed and I were being fired from one job after another. <laughs> there you are. The only good job I had was for the New York Times, my first one, where I was able to do drawings and set type, so I learned about typography and and production. Um, and after the, my other jobs that I got fired at, I didn't learn anything. <laughs> I'll stop right there. Uh, I hinted at this in the introduction, but I'm interested in how each of you kind of has a very unique title for how you describe what you do. Um, Jane, you've said you're an architect without a portfolio. Seymour, you say you're a designer who illustrates. Um, and Jack, you're a maker specifically, um, which is different in your mind from an artist. I wonder if you could each talk about um, kind of how important, you know, how you identify yourself, how important that is um, in how you kind of make your way in the, in the design field. Who goes first? Do you want to start, Jane? Uh, well, uh, since I signed on to this, 18, it was, it was eight over 80, excuse me, when we started. <laughs> I, I, it's very important in my life, I discovered that I was over 80. <laughs> One day I <laughs> woke up and said, who's counting? Uh, nobody is <laughs> giving me the hot news. Um, I think it's a, it, it's a terrible, uh, it, it, it's an intense uh, experience to, de to do design. But I think, I think it's not a skill, you know, and it's not a set of toys and things. It's a, a mood. It's, a, it's really a point of view about life to begin with. Um, and what things you want to in discover and indulge in. Um, and so I think that's why we have universal interests in different and in design for everything else. But um, I don't know that anything else, the only thing that motivated me was just good luck moving on. Uh, everything broke my way. I got new jobs and uh, I don't ever remember another interview in my case, but I think it's the, it's the, uh, uh, the genuine spread of challenges that design contains. And, and in this I must be very specific because I think the, it's the use of the senses that gives us the pleasures that we get out of design of just ch challenge, challenging uh, what you see or what you don't see or how you want to do it. It, it uses all parts of our mind that don't you know, ha happen in banking and uh, uh, other quantitative careers. And I think if you, if you really understand that, you don't feel left, you know, left out because you like different things and you're more interested in colors than in drinks and so on. I think it's allowing yourself to, to do your best and do the most that you can imagine and uh, never feel, and, and always feel superior about it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but don't let on. <laughs> Seymour, is there more at work? Oh, uh, oh. I, should, I should really say, look, I, I've done uh, architecture, graphics, magazine publishing, uh, schools, kindergartens. I mean, I, I've done an enormous number of things, and they've all but mostly been self-generated. And I've never in, ever had the moment of saying I'm not being a designer. I'm not an architect because... I, I got architects tough, and it, I, I was into too many children by the time this this struck me. But I was integrated into the system, and the things you can do for people when you get into the design world is is was what really motivated me. And finally, with Ben, make a better world. That's, I mean, why waste our time? Uh, making all this terrible stuff which nobody ever 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 fixes or designs 
but mainly the, it's the environment, in my mind at least, it's the total environment of humanity that you're looking at and little bits of, of uh, convenience and pleasure and taking away of pain is, is really worth, worth the effort. And you get a lot of good things out of it too. So think big. <laughs> Seymour, in your description as a designer who illustrates, is there, um, is that, does that describe sort of how you think about design or is how you've brought sort of those two disciplines together? Well, I, uh, yeah, designing, um, I'm a designer and an illustrator, uh, I, because I want to control everything that I'm doing, especially in print. Uh, I, uh, yeah, there are illustrators, who just do the image part of something and they don't know, they're not interested in topography, they don't care what the art director does with their work. Um, but I prefer to handle the whole thing, whether it was a book jacket or it's, it's, it's a poster, um, because it's, it's all together, it's all one thing, it's all design. Mm -hmm. And there's so much you can do. I mean, you, you can illustrate with, with type. Um, there are, uh, nowadays, the designers, type uh, designers are doing terrific stuff and going really crazy with type and doing wonderful things. Um, on the other hand, um, I'm always uh, drawn to, uh, you know, I love to draw. And um, for some reason, the stuff that most of the stuff that I comes out that I do comes out funny. Um, <laughs> maybe it's, it may be because I'm really tied to the, the comics of the '30s. I never got over the '30s. My best decade. Well, it were, they it was were great. great. They were great. The comics were great. Huh. The cars were great. The movies were wonderful. Uh, that was the best decade. <laughs> I never got over it. <laughs> Well, good. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to circle back on this notion of, um, you know, all of you have been part of, of era-defining communities throughout the years. Um, Jane, you touched upon the early MoMA years in the 50s. Um, mm. uh, Seymour, you talked about the art squad in high school and, and Pushpin. Um, Jack, we'd love to hear more about um, the early days of your showroom in Manhattan in 1951 when it first opened. Could you tell us a bit about your, your very incredible client list and, and how, how that happened, how that came about? I was lucky. I was uh, given for at least six months a fine uh, top floor studio in a fancy neighborhood. Um, it was a walk up, of course, and it was, but it had skylights and uh, enough space for for looms and living, and uh, it, was, it was and it was affordable. Uh, and uh, uh, there was I had some posh neighbors downstairs and uh, people that made the world change and their clients would walk up the stairs to see what I was doing and uh, that often led to uh, introductions and uh, orders and uh, um, I uh, worked day and night and, uh, and liked everything about it. Um, it's uh, it attracted press as well, and uh, that was very important too. Uh, I found that that the design editors were much more on their toes than designers because they spent the life looking for talents and uh, not doing the same old thing every day. And uh, they, uh, I, I got to, to like them, and they they were they were they were very useful. And I remembered. When I was an undergraduate, the, what I'd seen in our college uh, museum was a Chinese inscription uh, that uh, be an open bowl that some 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 uh, something good might fall, opportunity might fall in, and. Uh, <laughs> I decided, well, I, I don't want a job, and I'll just be an open bowl, and, and I'll, uh, if uh, they ask me to design anything, I'll, I'll, I will, I'll try. 
and uh, uh, I spent my life designing many things and uh, uh, sheets and towels and, and dinnerware and uh, we even thought of uh, cars at one time uh, and anything that they would allow me to design I did and uh, and in 60 countries and uh, to to not to go as a visitor but to go as a worker and work with other craftsmen uh, and we understood each other without language uh, it was remarkable and they knew things that I needed to know and uh, they did things that I wanted to learn uh, and so that's how I spent uh, 50 years uh, designing everything I was allowed to. And Jack's being very modest, but I'm just going to list some of the architects he worked with in those years. Marcel Breuer, Louis Kahn, Gordon Bunshaft, Frank Lloyd Wright, Eero Sarnin, the list truly goes on. <laughs> Could you tell us about one of those really iconic commissions you've worked on, whether it was the Miller home or the Miller house or the Lever house? <laughs> the two things that was lucky for me is that I was a primary shareholder of my business. And no one, uh, usually there's a sales manager who said, let's do what we did best, sold best last year, or that they sold best last year. And uh, I can say no. Um, I understand where you're coming from, but I, I want to do something I've never done before. And uh, the, uh, that was useful. Uh, that I could say no. And my other privilege was to work with some of the greatest architects of my time. Corbu accepted, but uh, uh, I worked on Brasilia, and I worked for Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, most, most everybody. And I was so impressed by their talent and their understanding of things. I tried to make what they wanted me to and it pulled me out of the ruts uh, of doing things I'd never done before. And that was uh, immeasurably important. Uh, I am so gratitude. And many of them, like Ed and Barnes, became friends. And, and I, I gained from the process. And Jane, you mentioned earlier your partnership with your husband, both you know personally and professionally. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I think that's something um, that many people would love to figure out how to do. Uh, and you, you've met. <laughs> it's sort of the dream, right, to, to kind of merge those two things. Well, um, talk, talking about luck. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I just, I disagree. I don't disagree. I compassion with the people who have don't have a, a good working relationships and put, are put in them and cannot and you know, can, cannot control them and I think we are all working on that very hard to make make everything uh, much smoother and women understand the role of women now I spend a lot of time I've written articles and, and given lectures and so on about what women contribute and now I'm thinking more spatially things uh, uh, in interiors and and, and public space, oh, so important, um, uh, that, that will make everybody realize women have a lot of things men don't have. I mean, they have a lot of talents and they bring points of view and so on. I don't have to tell you, you all know it, but the public has to know it and the and, and your colleagues have to know it. And little by little, you know, we're banging down the door. Um, with Ben, uh, Ben was such a completely innate designer, um, holistic, sensory guy. He was also, you know, a big guy in the Navy for four or five years, so he wasn't, he wasn't coming at this in a soft way. He just saw things. He saw the relationships of things. He saw how people sat in chairs, and he comes up with a whole uh, program, which is more small chairs in rooms. Why? 
people like big chairs. But if you have small chairs, people can pick them up and move them around and have a, a, a discussion group very easily. And you can't move those damn Mies chairs an inch. <laughs> he really felt that because that's the reception you're getting in most of the corporations. He, he had an extraordinary talent, an awful lot of background. Uh, and you know, uh, 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 imagination a minute. And he, he also was a nice guy. He wasn't out to put anyone else out of business or, or, uh, or whatever, or even get top awards, which he did, and, and we did. Uh, it, was, it was a clique of personalities, the two of us, and I'd had a few priors. Um, <laughs> well, it's a good good to know what, uh, know it when it happens. <laughs> and uh, we, and w our imaginations leaped Im and completely and immediately into the large scale problems that we were having within the '60s. And, and you know, we'd been through all kinds of stages. He ran design research entirely. I mean, it was his invention. He bought all the. Goods. He went to Europe, of course, and brought things to America that we'd never had, um, and it was a, hu a huge success. And then we started thinking about two things: restaurants, which were sorely, sorely lacking by anything anyone had ever been to Europe, and the other was um, a marketplace that happened to be about to be torn down and we were saving all all buildings that we had anything to do with. We you saved the half of the Harvard Yard. And it wasn't nobody knew when you did this. It wasn't an ego, it didn't show anybody. It's just uh, it, the presence of something that all that was really made good and use it use it again, particularly on the campus at Harvard. You know, it made a point and made a little inroad into the perceptions of the people who make these places and, and run them and so on. Uh, and I can tell you, this, it's only a question of personality and temperament. We had the same temperaments and we had uh, more or less the same children. Uh, <laughs> all together, some of them are still around. Um, but we had the same goals, basically, which is to make, I mean, Benjamin was outspoken. His word was joy. What we need in this world is joy. And I'm going to bring joy to those lawyers in the Harvard <laughs> Law School until it kills me. Because <laughs> they lead such a miserable life, he said. <laughs> But he, he, he really meant it because everything you did made somebody feel better or didn't or not better, and that went we, we went into the restaurant business in a big way because there were no good restaurants, and that was in seventy in the seventies, and we made one, we made four more, and they were all the Harvest the restaurant in in Boston is having its fiftieth anniversary. A restaurant lasted six to 50 years. Well, it's hard to understand why. And I can only say because people like it, particularly because you could talk in this restaurant. It wasn't, a, you know, it wasn't a jamboree. But these things convey themselves to people. And p people understand that this place was really meant to be comfortable and it's a good place to take people to dinner. But whatever it is, it's worked. Uh, and I, I, I credit him for all the last minute things. I, I made some of the things happen, very much so. Um, but we never had a bad day, okay? <laughs> um, and Seymour, I'll direct this next one at you. Um, you know, we've established that all, all three of you are legends in, in your field uh, and in the field of design. Um, and as members of, of this kind of groundbreaking, great, groundbreaking community, um, and Seymour in particular, Pushpin, um, you know, did you have a sense as as you were beginning um, your career and you were working on the Pushpin graphic and it was starting to, you know, you had an exhibition at the Louvre um, and people were recognizing your work. Did you have a sense of kind of the impact, the historical impact that was happening at the time? Um, or is that something that's kind of evolved later? Like, did you have a, a sense of how seminal this work kind of would become? Uh, I think we were just doing jobs. 
Mm -hmm. right? it was, and we were looking for work and looking for the kind of work that we wanted to do. And that's why we put out the publications of Pushpin Graphic. Um, it's certainly a surprise when we were invited to have a show at the Lou because we were the first American design studio to show to show there. But um, we figured they knew what they were doing, so it was okay. <laughs> Uh, and we had a great time, except that when we arrived in, in Paris, uh, in the in the section of the Louvre where that we were allotted, uh, the show was going to open a couple of days. Nothing was on the walls because the workers just, just they spent all the time having coffee yeah. or drinking or whatever they yes. did. Yeah. Uh, so everybody at Pushpin had a. Uh, get the hammer and nails and hang up, hang up the work. <laughs> Before I forget, I wanted to say that I'm totally inadequate here. I only work in two dimensions generally here. <laughs> well, I'll lend you one dimension. Oh, oh please. <laughs> All right. There are three dimensional we people need you. here. <laughs> I feel uh, totally All of you flat. are very multi dimensional. <laughs> <laughs> what was your question? You answered you answer the question. Oh, good. Okay. okay. <laughs> And, and Jane, you kind of touched upon the early ID years um, very briefly, but kind of, I'd love to reframe that question for, for that period of your career, um, given that it, you were the founding editor of the first magazine to be focused on industrial design. Mm -hmm. As the profession was still kind of emerging and defining itself, did you have a sense of the, the responsibility and the gravitas of, of starting such a project and, and uh, the number of years it would, it would continue to influence the field? I don't know what sense I had. Uh, I was f four years in, in MoMA and you know, working up. I was an assistant uh, curator by the time I decided to go to interiors where I went with the architectural editor. And then one, and uh, then I went, they called me to interiors to become their, their editor. And then one day, two years later, the ed editor came to me and said, well, it's time for industrial design. We have, you know, we're interiors. We, we, they were the best printed uh, magazine in design anywhere. And uh, we, I, you know, will you be the editor or starter? We, I mean, so what do you want? <laughs> what do you want in your magazine? And he said, oh, uh, that's really up to you. I mean, we like fortune because it has a big gatefold and things are colorful and unexpected. I said, well, fortune on what? I mean, there's no money in this at all. So what we did was a poor man's version. <laughs> but I got De Deborah Allen, my co-author, and the two of us had matching talents. And she was a journalist and she'd been an architect too. And they said, make a magazine. And we, uh, I mean, the basic philosophy was, <laughs> those guys are smart. They, they're in Detroit and they're in all the factories and so on. And they don't know anything about the consumer, the consumer market, or how people live and use their product, whatever, small or large. And we're all day long banging up against things we would like to redesign ourselves. So we have a very large inventory of things to talk to designers about. And, um, and we did. I mean, we were the customer in a way. And, and of course, we waited in and talked their language. But the problems that we asked were, were information to them. Uh, not not uh, other other kinds of stuff, and the, of course the, re the response was was enormous um, over many years. And one of the best things that happened, and one I think the reason I started it, is because I hired a guy as an associate editor, and that's Ralph Kaplan. And it was just so I could talk to Ralph for the rest of my life, right? <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of others. I mean, we had a wacky time. We just did what we thought was, was uh, high journalistic originality for, for a trade, no trade magazine ever looked like this. And high content. And we were, you know, in, in cahoots with their, all, the, all the offices and all the things they were doing, and we tried to make the auto industry better. 
Uh, and once in a while it worked. Uh, we brought in beautiful, beautiful stuff from Finland and other countries in Europe. Once you discover Europe, you, you know, you, you have to get on your toes. And um, that made a, I mean, that's the only way they saw them. There was nothing else publishing the same thing, right? Uh, for years and years and years. So, um, is that, is that enough? <laughs> uh, we we had a, it was a great it was a great thing and we never we we, we were not a we we're not a magazine in, in the conventional way and that's why I think why it was so much fun because everybody knew somebody else and they were writers they were actors they were musicians and so on and they, and we knew a lot of people in the mag good magazines in the, in the culture magazines too. And we're, all of our messages were, do something better with this, because it needs help. <laughs> and uh, find one that shows that you can do it, and so on. So it was a confidence-making, uh, what shall I say, conscience. <laughs> So one of our uh, important criteria for the book, aside from being design legends, was that everyone had to still be actively working. And each of you are involved in um, really interesting projects right now that I wonder if we could spend a little bit of time talking about. Um, Jack, you just mentioned backstage that you have a book coming out um, next month. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that. And also, um, or I, we'll just go ahead with that and then we'll. This is my 11th or 12th uh, book. Uh, most of them have been big. This one is little. It's called Learning from Longhouse. And it has to do with our foundation in East Hampton in which we try to do things right and uh, irrespective of money. And some things cost, cost money and many things don't. Uh, but it's, it's a designer's house and uh, it's a case study which was a great idea in the, in the 50s of building houses that were, were teaching houses and they showed you alternative ways to to think about housing and living and it was a great idea and ours is bigger than that and it has 16 acres of sculptural garden uh, but it is a teaching place and the book is is about teaching I think it's wonderful this organization is talking to uh, the mid-century uh, people uh, because we, we, we were a cause. We believed in something very strongly and we tried to make it happen. And in many cases, we did. And uh, it worked because it was a small, it was small cause in a way. Uh, the furniture didn't become big until contract was invented later on, and uh, then uh, the, uh, we we thought we'd won over the establishment when uh, uh, twenty-story buildings and four fifty-story buildings wanted designers to uh, work on them, and we thought that was just great. But they bought us off. Um, uh, we 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 got our heads were turned. 50 millions, 50 stories, and that sounded very important. It wasn't really. Um, and uh, a lot of those buildings aren't very good. Um, and uh, I'm glad uh, that somebody's talking to us because uh, many younger people are writing about mid-century design and they're making it up. Um, they, th <laughs> they, they, they thought it was, as they, as they th presumed it must be, uh, and not necessarily. Um, and what's really sad, in spite of the success of our cause, um, we haven't solved everything. Um, <laughs> right. When I was in architecture school, uh, we laughed at uh, the 30s uh, uh, residential design, which was, uh, some of it was Spanish, some was English, some was uh, any old style, but uh, not yeah. really designed for people. And we would design for people and we would make things work and so forth. And uh, we did somewhat. 
But the biggest thing, that, the biggest sadness for me is the fact that post-war housing for most people is worse than pre-war. <laughs> the design is worse and the craftsmanship is worse. It may have air conditioning and uh, dishwashers and an elevator, but uh, most Americans now live in tawdry uh, housing. Uh, and the younger designers can change that. Uh, the, we, the pioneering architects were told uh, that they couldn't afford to work on houses, and most of them didn't, except for, for the 1%. And we have some fine examples of very special houses, but the housing that most live in, in a craftsmanship, uh, is, uh, nothing about it is good. Uh, Right, and, designed for demolition, right? <laughs> and uh, we, we, we look forward to seeing some solutions. And Seymour, you are, as I mentioned, in the midst of a Kickstarter campaign. Could you tell us a little bit about the book that you're working on? Yeah, I guess it started in, uh, in the late 50s. Um, I would learned about uh, setting type from a class at, at uh, Cooper Union. Uh, I decided to do a little little book with the Lenoim cuts all on wars. Uh, there were about a dozen cuts, wars through the ages. Um, and I, I had some quotations about, about war and I, I I printed, I had a little small hand press and I printed them, printed 80 copies of this uh, book. It was called A Book of Battles. Um, uh, about 30 years later, I, uh, in one issue of um, the Pushpin Graphic, which was the, um, the complete history of the world condensed, uh, that was the theme of that, uh, that issue, uh, I did a, um, a timeline of all the wars since uh, 2000 BC up to the, the present, which was I guess 1980 or something like that. Um, and that idea sort of stuck with me. Doing uh, the idea is that that right now we've we've we have a history of 5,000 years of wars, and they never change. There are always <laughs> nations fighting each other. It's always fighting for power. It just the with name. young young people <laughs> are dying. Um, uh, yeah, the, well, the countries could change, but then they can change again. I mean, it's <laughs> totally interchangeable. It's like a big game of chess that's, that they're doing, and <laughs> poor people are, are suffering and dying and suffering. Um, so the, this book that, I've, that I'm working on now is, is the latest uh, timeline book with doing a, picking out um, 35 wars to illustrate in this book uh, in, in different, you know, all, all black and white, but um, a few woodcuts, mostly um, uh, pen and ink drawings. And um, uh, now it's, there's a, a Kickstarter campaign to get this thing off the ground and, and, and have it published because publishers are not particularly interested in the subject. <laughs> but I think it's, I think it's worthwhile. Uh. It's sad, and um, what I've, I've said about that book is that there is no ending. It seems to be no way to, to end this thing up, and there's very little that we here can do about it, um, but I guess just becoming aware of, of this, was the notion good, of war. Was warfare. there a good book? Was there a good war? A good war? <laughs> um, hard to find. Well, the... World War Two uh, had to be had to be fought, but that was because World War One. World War One was one of those stupid wars, mm. uh, and if they if that had been avoided, there would have not have been a World War Two. And then we have other silly wars like like the Vietnam War and the Iraq War. Well, we know you can that. name it. Was there Grenada. Any, was there any good ones? Well, maybe the American Revolution was okay. <laughs> That was a good one. Okay. 
And Seymour, as a as a publishing model, I mean, what how how are you looking at Kickstarter? I mean, you've done so much self-publishing over the years. Is this something that you think you'll keep doing, perhaps? You With other other projects? Yeah. Yeah, I can't get it out of my head. I don't know. I I, I also paint. Uh, mostly on weekends, and I find myself painting battle scenes. Um, <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to have, do drawings of airplanes yeah, fighting of each other, you know, in, in battle, and with shooting little blah, 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 all over, and uh, I guess it's, I've never really grown up, because I, I do paintings like that now. Airplanes crashing, in, you know, warplanes crashing into each other. Mm. And um, I, I'm uh, totally obsessed by it. <laughs> That's a good obsession. And Jane, I don't know how much you can tell us about um, the new project you're working on uh, about the oh, Bauhaus. If I'd that, love to tell you. Would you like to tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> well, in the backstage, when I wasn't taking care of nine children and three or four businesses, uh, I got very interested because I lived in Cambridge, uh, finally, and I met Walter Gropius, and um, got very interested in the, in the Bauhaus as the, as the beginning of modernism, uh, and the way we think about things, very, very much so the things I've said today. I mean, I knew it before I talked to Grop, but I didn't know how it happened. Um, Edgar Kaufman, who was the guy in the next room for, to Philip Johnson, they didn't talk, of course, but I talked to Edgar. He, he made a foundation and he gave away prizes. I was on his board of directors and they gave a prize to three people and the third was an international prize and there was money attached to it. A very serious thing, but um, there were three books, there were three, Olibetti, uh, Charles and Raims, and Gropius for, for founding the foundation course of des way to des design. So as you said, well, I've got three books. I want you to write some books. So take 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 the material and go to. I said, well, I think I'll get a few friends. <laughs> I got a few friends. Three of us started it, started off, and I think mostly we 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 lost uh, altitude on that for a while. But I kept on. Following it, and I went to I went to Europe. I listened. I heard what this place had been, and there was no reference. There's still in this day is no reference to what that school did or why or whatever. I mean, it's absolutely a fantastic thing. And, uh, and so I went to Ben and I went behind the Berlin Wall after it had been to see the stuff in East Germany to see the buildings that the uh, Gropius had, had set up and then the final, here's this beautiful white building with, a, 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 a fantasy. Well, we found out, you know, that the, the East had never heard of the Bauhaus. It was sitting there, right in their midst. And, uh, why are you Americans coming over here and asking us about, this, this is just a trade school. When we told them a few things, I think this has started the ball rolling, and t 10 years later they re restored it completely. And I have uh, a, an enormous archive of recorded, in, uh, recorded uh, interviews with all the major players that were alive in the 60s, and there were a great deal, and Gropius hours, and all the students that came from America and went to the Bauhaus. And, uh, Anyway, I, I make an archive and I, I'm donating it to Harvard now. Uh, so it has voice and it has sound and it has documentation that is unknown in this country. And the Harvard libraries are putting it through. But the great news is that the Germans decided to have a, a testimonial a centennial uh, celebration on the founding, 1919, when, when Gropius walked through that door in a little, I mean, you, you wouldn't believe it, and brought these amazingly brilliant painters and teachers and so on with him, and he knew he had to teach 
architecture differently because nobody knew anything. They were culturally devoid. They'd been at war for five years. Anyway, he did it. He got to, uh, got it set and so on. Um, and so the, the ceremony is 1919, 2019, which gives us three years. And every museum at Harvard is going to put forth something for their, uh, for, for, for their collections uh, or ideas or whatever. And I'm leading the one for the Fogg Museum. Uh, and r related Deutsche Museum and probably others. And I'm giving them the whole archive <laughs> so that they can have this exhibition. It's just a, it's such a tickle that it turned out nobody would talk to me. Who talks about, uh, about the Gropius? I mean, he was he was put out of business by Walter by Bill Johnson, and uh, so Mies could be king of the roster, which he he was all his life. And Gropius was just doing things. But anyway, that's that, that's going to be big news when this thing finally gets done, because it, will, it no, no one has. The closeness to the product, product is, uh, as I do, and I recommend it as a very important. What the message of, of how we did this and the thinking that went into it. It's not done just the school, which was fabulous too. Uh, is everything that we know in modernism hidden in various times and places? But it it always goes back to the things that they the thinking they established, you know, a hundred years ago. Wonderful. So we'll we'll keep a lookout for all those amazing projects. Yeah, so. uh, you'll probably hear about it in all your college. <laughs> Sadly, we are running a little bit over time, but we would like to conclude with one last question, and that is um, for everyone here that that's come to this talk and and hear you speak. Um, do you have any words of advice or or wisdom from all your years of experience that that you can offer to us, whether it's uh, for someone that's looking to get into the field, is in the field already, or is just starting out? I do. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't feel that young designers should look for a job. <laughs> they should look for what they want to do and do it. And uh, uh, forget about uh, uh, being responsible to somebody else. Um, uh, I never had a job, fortunately. I would have taken one, probably, if offered it. But not having a job is a wonderful life. Of just doing the things you think need to be done. And uh, uh, that someone will find, find you if you're doing something wonderfully well and doing it with all your heart. Uh, it, it's, that's, it's small is the way everything could start. The Bauhaus was a very small school. So was Cranbrook and, and yeah. Black Mountain. And they changed the world. Yeah, uh, right. uh, and uh, individuals do that and be, will be one of them. You'll have a wonderful life. Good advice. <laughs> I think you should have a job. <laughs> At least, you at least learn, one. <laughs> learn one job. You learn a lot, and after a few years, then you take complete control, freelance for the rest of your life. Uh, but uh, and having that job gives you a paycheck if you if you need one, um, so that you have something to something to fall back on when you when the phone does not ring, and. Um, Nobody cares about yeah. uh, about you until they find out how really terrific you are. <laughs> uh, my um, message is that you should go outside the mainstream, but not too far. You know, work hard and save your money. That's it. <laughs> well, I think I've given you advice about go where. Where, uh, which I follow your bliss. That's the best. Uh, that's the best advice, because you do best at what you like to do, and it it shows you're you're known. I also think you can do it without having a job, and probably a little of both. But 
every business that I've, I'm in, I was at four or five restaurants and schools and, you know, Navy PR, all of these things w were originated by me or us or our group. They, they were not commissions. And we did a lot of those too, but we thought of things that had to be done and, and we moved in and, and did it, starting small. But don't be afraid if you can get your marbles together, <laughs> uh, even working half and half with some, some, someone o older, to try, try it. It's, it's, it's a busy world, it's tough. But whatever you do to put it into your thinking and your vision and your way of using your senses, of course, is going to pay back because people will know it. They'll feel it when you converse with them. So I, that's what I say is go for it. Well, thank you. I think that's a great note to end on. So please join me in thanking Jane Thompson, Seymour Cross, and Jasmine Oyer.